Welcome back. This is lecture 25 in our series. And today we're moving into a deeper layer in our understanding of uh, quantum field theory. Right? So far we have focused on leading order calculation. That means we first learned how to quantize these theories and then we, we, we uh, took a look at interacting. First we did it for the free theories and then we took a look at the interacting theories at first order in the expansion on these uh, weak interactions. We assumed the interaction could be taken perturbatively could be included in the theory perturbatively and we looked at the very first term for each of the interactions we looked so far. So we looked at lambda phi 4, we looked at uh, Yukawa interaction in the exercises, we did a few other interactions, but always at leading order, right? And we defined uh, in a very ad hoc way um, the what is a cross section and, and how to relate that part was more ad hoc was was how do we relate the green functions that we get from the quantizations of, of these theories to the uh, matrix elements that go into the cross section right so the LSZ formalism was put by hand at this point right now we want to look at these perturbative series but instead of stopping at the very first term we want to understand the, the structure of these sums right and see what kind of objects we can take out of there because so far what you can do with what you learn in this course so far is calculate cross sections at leading order basically you can as long as you, it does not involve loops as long as you not putting um, higher order corrections then you can calculate cross sections but that's pretty much it right now we want to look at, at uh, objects that involve more terms in these sums, right? It's, it's still, we're still not calculating loops yet and going to renormalization, right? But uh, we want to, to see what kind of resummations uh, we can do with this series and what objects we can define. The very first uh, thing I want to define is this generating functional for connected diagrams. Right? And in order to do that, of course, I have to be very clear and specify what do I mean by connected diagrams. In order to do that, we go back to lambda phi 4, because at this point, we don't need any of the complications introduced by fermions or spin one bosons, right? This, uh, the, the whole uh, logic will be exactly the same, but the algebra will be more complicated in the other cases. So when, when that's the case, we better go back to the scalar and do the simplest algebra that allows us to see uh, uh, the physical point I'm trying to make, right? So for lambda phi 4, we can pretty much straight out draw the series in terms of Feynman diagrams for any green function that uh, I want. Let's consider first the four point function, right? Which is the simplest one that shows uh, the difference between connected and, and, and unconnected diagrams. So at leading order, in fact, the free theory, right? Lambda to the power zero, right? There are four diagrams that contribute to the uh, four point function. And they are these four. So this is the first one. Then there is this one. So the way I'm drawing here, I would have to label these four points x1, x2, x3, x4, but I won't be doing that all the time. Assume that this point is the same as that one, this is the same as this one, so I'm keeping the position of the points fixed, right, to differentiate the diagrams. And then there is this one, right, these lines do not cross here, they're going behind each other. So this is it for the free theory, right? If I go to the first order in perturbation theory, then I have more diagrams. So the first one would be this one, right? The first one that actually involves the vertex and all the four external points. So now this is a vertex, right? I also have a diagram like this, Right? Four propagators meeting here. 
times the whole expansion of this order, right? So, by this I mean uh, diagrams like this one, for instance. Times the bubble, right? So, it's the vacuum bubble times these three uh, diagrams up there. And I also have uh, many combinations of diagrams like taking one of these guys, say the first one, and putting a loop correction in it. Right? So I just added this loop correction. I can add it to the bottom leg, the bottom uh, propagator too. Right? And I can do that here, 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 and here. So I have a few extra diagrams. I won't draw them all. Right? So for instance, this one. And so it goes. I have six in total here, right? because I can put it in six different places. Right? At order lambda square, I have a few uh, genuinely new diagrams, right? So, for instance, this one appears at the order lambda square, right? There are a few others, right? like, uh, for instance, this one. And this, but I also have the bubble times the whole order one series, right? So the, again, the bubble can be multiplied by all of that, right? And I have a few new order lambda square bubbles, which are, for instance, this one. I have this one. And these I multiply by the order zero series, right? can have all of that uh, over there. And again, I have something similar to this, right? Where I take the previous uh, order. Let me make this a little bit more clear. Where I take the previous order, say this diagram, and I attach... Uh, loops everywhere I can, right? So, in this case, there's four places I can attach them here, here, and, you know, there's two other options. And also, I can go here and take this part and attach more complicated loops. I can take this part and do something like, for instance, this, or even attach uh, uh, a loop to another loop, right? Now there are many places that I can attach, right? Only looking only at this diagram, there's already one, two, three, four places I can put an, another loop, right? And there's also, you see how complicated it gets uh, really fast, right? I can also add loops now that are intrinsically order two. And these guys can also be added uh, now looking at the diagrams of order zero at six different places, right? Any order uh, lambda square loop can be added and so on and so forth, right? So, the idea here is for now to see just how complicated uh, this series can be, right? 
but let's try to to organize it right let's try to identify uh, how many uh, different kinds of diagrams can show up there the first category i want to define is is uh, of of the diagrams that have vacuum bubbles into them right so these little parts here that have no connection to any of the external points of the diagram right this is what i'm calling vacuum bubbles right and we already know what happens to those right uh, if you don't remember go back to these uh, pages in the lecture notes but i have shown that you can actually factor the sum over all vacuum bubbles right and make this into an exponential that becomes a multiplicative factor to the sum right that now contains only the diagrams without any vacuum bubble right and then becoming a, a multiplicative factor this thing goes out of any observable because i'm always dividing by the same series in the, the, the in the denominator right so I, I essentially don't have to worry about vacuum bubbles because they go away the second uh uh, category of diagrams is what I call the disconnected diagram right I have warned you before that I would improve on my definition uh, uh, and of connected and disconnected and this is uh, th this is what I'm doing now right so now I'll call a disconnected diagram any diagram in which all the four external points uh, or, or all the external points here I'm showing it for the four point four, four point function here I'm showing you for a six point function right but if I cannot go from one of the external points into all the others this is a disconnected diagram right I cannot go from this point into this one just walking through the propagators of the theory same here for the six point functions right these four I connected but not all of them are connected the two external points down here are separated from the rest so this is what i call uh, a disconnected diagram and i have already invited you to think about what happens to these guys in one of the exercise lists of previous uh, lectures right i i asked you to think about what happens with these guys when you apply the lsz uh, reduction formula to them right and the answer is that they won't contribute to scattering but we'll see that with more detail in the next lecture and finally the third category of um, diagrams are the connected ones right which are defined in uh, complementary way with these ones right connected diagrams will now be uh, called connected diagrams the ones that are fully connected i mean there's no piece that i can separate from the rest from the, the rest here right any of the external points uh, is connected to all of the other external points that the, the two examples here and there are another one for the six point function on the right here all the external points are connected right it is uh, reasonable to say that what I call a scattering between two particles for instance two initial ones and two final ones or even between three particles initially and three final particles right what I call a scattering is a scattering that involves all of them right so I'm not talking about these when I'm thinking of a scattering right this this the particle that started here and had no interaction with the particle that started here they just went through each other right even with these bubbles in the middle right so and and again if you did the exercise i proposed or you already know that these guys won't contribute to scatterings because of the lsc uh, reduction formula so it is uh, reasonable even if you didn't do the exercise it is reasonable to think that uh, i only care about these diagrams when i'm talking about scattering right what i want to do now and convince you of is that there is a, fu a generating functional that will give me only these diagrams right 
we know that when I take z of j and start doing uh, functional derivatives on z, I'll get all three types of diagrams above, right? I'll get all kinds of diagrams, right? Now I want to define a different object, which will be defined by this relation. I'll call this W of J, right? And what I want to convince you now is that this guy, right, generates only the connected diagrams. And in that way, it, it, it's more useful uh, to us, right, if you want only to get connected diagrams. Right? So let's uh, set out to prove that, right? I want to show you that this is the case for W. Let's start by writing how the green functions are obtained from the, the usual functional generator, right? We know that G N of a number of points, N points in this case, right? in the presence of sources is just uh, obtained by applying N derivatives in N external points to this uh, z of j, right? So that we know. Now I want to write the same thing diagrammatically, right? I, I, I'm, I'll try to look at the structure of this series. And of course, this is much easier to do in terms of diagrams than analytical expressions, right? So I want to define first the full generator, right? This object in terms of diagrams. And I'll use the following symbol. So I'm defining now this box. And J here means I'm calculating it in the presence of sources. If I put a box without a J means in the absence of sources, right? And this box is connected to a number of external points, right? So this symbolizes basically any diagram with n minus 1, x, n, with x external legs, right? So that's the first definition. And of course, we know that g0 in the presence of sources, right? This is in the presence of sources, right? Does not depend on any external point. And that's just z of j, right? Because I make no derivatives, right? And this is, by definition, that box without any external legs. So this box is, is uh, just the functional generator and making functional derivatives attaches external legs to this, right? I also want to define the action of the source of J, right? We have used this before, but I'll put the formal definition here. I'll write this just like that, right? So J of X is indicated like that, right? This is usually integrated over all space time, right? But that gives me the expression uh, in terms of diagrams for the sources, right? And then, of course, we, we, we used a lot of these, right? Then a propagator contracted with a source, right? So I have a scalar product here, the for x, right? This is defined. This is a function that depends only on y, right? And this is written in this way. Right? So y and x is is not here because it does not depend on x. Sometimes I will just write this, and in this case that is not integrated, I can put it like that, and then it depends on x too, right? Until I integrate on x. Right? And now I want to make a distinction between the all diagrams that are contained in this box and the connected diagrams. And I use a circle to indicate any connected diagram. So suppose I, I take a look at all 
connected diagrams with just one external point. This is how I indicate it. So when I have a box, it means all diagrams. And when I have a circle, it means only the connected ones. So let's take a look at the one point function for lambda phi 4 and separate those two, just as an illustration. This expression for the one point function we have calculated before, but that's easy to see, right? If you differentiate the exponential in x, you get this delta of x minus y that appears here times j, right? This is contract. What we want to calculate now is the order lambda 1, right? The first correction, because this is still free theory, right? I want to calculate the first correction to this and see all the diagrams that will uh, show up, right? So this is done here, right? Remember, I can rewrite the exponential, the, the potential for the theory in terms of derivatives in j's. That's what I did here. And then I expanded the exponential to leading to order one in lambda, right? So this is the first insertion of the interaction. And this derivative is to make this the one point function. So I'm differentiating in relation to the external point, which is x, right? What I'm calculating now is uh, one point function of x, right? Uh, I won't do these all these derivatives in detail. I have to differentiate these five times. It's a bunch of product rules and, and, and chain rules for, for derivatives. If you want to see the details, I have all the intermediate steps in my lecture notes, right? By now, that should be easy for you to do, to do right? And, and, and here's the answer, right? This is the effect of applying these four derivatives to uh, half of j delta j. You have these three terms, right? And then you have to differentiate this expression in relation to the external point, right? And you can act with this derivative in many places here. Uh, everywhere there's a j, right? And the exponential. And then you get this big expression here, which is what I'm interested in, right? So this is the order one correction to the one point function. Hmm? So now I want to, to translate these into diagrams, right? So we can see the structure of this series. So what, G1, in the presence of sources, as I said, I will indicate like this. So there's a box, because I'm still talking about all diagrams. There is a presence of source, and this thing depends on one external position, which is X. Right? The first, the very first contribution is here. It's just this, right? Is a propagator from X to the source, right? But the source is integrated all over the place. In fact, the integral is in the wrong variable here. Right? This should be an integral in Y. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm not putting y here to, to leave it understood that this is integrated all over space time, right? And that's multiplied by the exponential of j, delta j, that I'll put in the end outside these brackets, right? So now I, I want to put all those terms because also there's an exponential of j, delta j here. So I just put that in the end. Let's go term by term here, right? So first, this guy. Right? I have this, again, this propagator from x to some point, which I leave unspecified, is hidden inside this scalar product, right? There's an integral here uh, in some, uh, the position of this source, right? And I have this bubble, right? Actually, from the position of the vertex, which is z, I have two propagators going out and in. And this is a vacuum bubble, right? Again, for the same reason I don't put the position of the source here, I don't put the position of the vertex here because it, it is integrated, right? I'm integrating over the position of the vertex. And I don't have to put this factor 3 because this factor 3 conceals with this 4 factorial outside to give a 8 
in the denominator. And 8 is the symmetry factor of this guy. Remember, there's a factor 2, another factor 2, and a factor 2 in this direction. So it's a, the symmetry factor of this guy is 1 over 8, right? It's 8. So that means you divide it by 1 over 8. That's already included in the rules here. So I don't have to put the symmetry, right? The next term is this one, right? So starting from x, just to keep the same full range. I go from x to z. z is the position of my vertex, right, which is integrated. I have one propagator from z to z. And then from z to the source, which is also integrated all over space. Next term is this one. Again, I have this piece, which I know how to right just a propagator from x to the source then i have uh, something that goes from the source to z right and then from z to another source so this is twice here right i have two lines going from sources into z right and then a propagator from z to z and there is a symmetry factor that I invite you to check here, all right? Then the next term is this one, right? I start at x. From x, I go into z. And then I have three propagators going from z into the source. Right, and and that's that's the, the that's it. Right. The next one is just propagator from x to the source, right? And then four propagators from the source into the point z. Right. And then, of course, I always have higher order corrections, which I'm not calculating here. I will close these brackets. And then I have the exponential of propagator going from source to source, which is this. Again, the factor 2 is because of the symmetry factor here. I can exchange sources and the symmetry factors, all these numeric factors are already included in the diagram, right? Uh, by our definition of Feynman diagram. Yeah? Now what I want you to notice is this. There's important relation here that you can see diagrammatically. Yeah? I know how to write this guy, right? Up to order one, this is the zero uh, point green function, right? This guy is the identity plus this, right? Four point. Uh, again, I'm going on the, all, only to order lambda one. So I can only use one vertex and I know the identity is included here, right? Because this is an exponential. I have this guy, source to source, one vertex, right? And I have this. Source is everywhere, right? Plus order uh, lambda square, right? So try to convince yourself that using just one vertex, sources, right, how, as many as you need, right, as you want. Uh, that's all you can do, basically, right? That's, that's all you can write. You have to put more vertices, more vertices if you want to, to draw more complicated diagrams, right? And of course, this includes the exponential. I'm writing 
the zero point function at order lambda, right? On the flip side, if I want now to look at now this guy, let me get a circle. I can I can fish from this uh, uh, all these diagrams just the ones that are fully connected, right? These are this one. Remember, the criteria is I have to look at external points, and I, I everything else needs to be connected to the external point, right? So this is not it, right? This part is not connected to the external point. This guy goes in. This doesn't because, you know, this part is not connected to the sternal. This guy is not this guy and it's over, right? And of course, the exponential itself does not go in, right? Because it's just a multiplication, so it's not connected to the original, right? To the external point. And that means that just comparing these two, right, I can write the following relation. Let me get this guy. Which is very important, right? This is uh, very similar to what I did. I'm doing it at one loop order here. Uh, I mean, uh, first power in lambda, right? But this is very similar to what I did when I exponentiated the loops before, the, the vacuum bubbles before, right? For the same reason, I could separate all the... the um, the vacuum bubbles as a multiplicative factor to the diagrams that are actually connected to external point. Now I was also able to separate these guys that are essentially bubbles connected to the source, right? Which again is also integrated all over space and has no connection to this external point that I'm really looking at. So these guys have no influence to observations at that point, right? And that's why I can separate those two in this way, okay? which is very uh, important step. This can be also uh, shown for higher orders in lambda. You can go and calculate all the lambda square contributions and see this is true. In fact, you can even go to n order and resum it uh, uh, in the form of exponential, right? This, this multiplicative factor, just like I did for the bubble diagram. The only new things here are these now source-related terms, but it's the same story, right? You can show this for any order in lambda, right? Now, the two-point function is a little bit more complicated, right? Because it also involves uh, contributions. Let me write here, right? The two-point function now is this one. Again, I'm trying to separate the connected diagrams for, from all of them. But now, amongst many other things, right? I also have terms like this. So that's when the first thing that is not a bubble diagram, right? This is not a bubble diagram. Each of these... Uh, uh, terms is connected to one of my external points, right? So it influences that external point. But it's also not a fully connected one, right? And there are many terms like that. I could take uh, terms, for instance, at higher orders in the theory, in the interaction, right? Like this, for instance. These are not vacuum bubbles. But still, I don't want them here in the connected diagram, right? 
And besides, I also have the, the, the uh, of course, the bubbles multiplying these things, right? That's also in this series. Right? So in this case, it's not true that this guy will be just this one. times uh, the bubbles, right? This is not true in this case. Right? Because I have to remove these contributions, which in fact are of the form, right? If you look here, these contributions are of the form uh, x y and of course this is multiplied right? in fact these two are already multiplied because we know that once once you write this since there's nothing in the integrals that can show up here that influences the integrals here you can factor these two diagrams as one multiplying the other right so the most general thing that can show up here and then also bubbles, right? Is something that is the multiplication of these three factors, right? I can resum all the pieces that are connected to X. I can sum all the pieces that are connected to Y. And I can sum all the bubbles and write it like that. And I have to subtract here uh, from, the, from this expression, these contributions. Now, let me go back to this equation on here, right? and use the definition I, I, I made for Z and W and compare both, right? This definition up here, this one, right? So I know that on the left side of this equation, let me copy it, just put it down here for reference, right? On the left side, I have the one point function. So this is del, I don't want to color, it's del z of j, del j of x, right? This is, it, is this, right? Then I have something, right? Times j, which is z of j, right? Now, if we use z, of j equal to the exponential of minus w, right? What shows up here, if I want to relate those two, is minus del w of j del j of x, right? Since I can identify this guy with this one, and I can identify this guy with this one, that means that this is doing what I wanted, at least for the one-point function. W, differentiated in terms of J, is generating this function. In, fa in fact, the function that is generating all the connected di diagrams is minus W. It's not W, it's minus W that is doing this, right? Essentially, what I'm saying is that from this, I, 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 I'm getting this, right? And this is the generator of the connected function, right? Let's see what happens if I go now to this case, which is a little bit more complicated, right? Now I have to use the second derivative. So I want to calculate del to z of j, del j x, del j why? This, in terms of diagrams, is just x box j y. Right? 
And then I just do derivatives here, right? This will be a, another derivative of, of acting on this. So del, del j of y, oops, y, acting on z of j and minus del w j del j of x, which is z of j minus del w j del j of x minus del w j del j of y, right, which comes from the chain rule of the derivative, plus z of j minus the second derivative. When I act here, right, I get the second derivative in relation to y now, right? So now in terms of diagrams, what I'm getting is this guy is equal to this, as I already identified, right? Is this diagram. So X circle J multiply by the same thing with y, right, times z of j, that I'll put outside the, the parentheses, right? and this guy is the second derivative, x. y, j here, right? and multiplying this box, this is just j which is exactly what I expected, right? I said, this is not equal to this one, right? Because I also have this possibility. And you see, when I do this in terms of W, right? You can clearly see that the derivatives of W are what are getting me the connected part, but I also have this other part, right? So if I want to write the connected part, I can subtract these on this other side, right? And as always, there's this overall uh, bubble, a vacuum bubble uh, multiplicative factor. There's multiplying everyone, as always, right? So that's, that's the important part, right? Now I have this uh, generating functional for the connected uh, green function. Right? If I do my derivatives on the sources on W instead of J, then I get only connected diagrams. Also, there's a, 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 a analogy with uh, um, statistical physics right here, right? Uh, statistical mechanics here. Right? If, if remember, this is the equivalent of a partition function, right? And this will be the equivalent of a free energy. Uh, in, in our case here, the free energy leads to more important uh, quantities than the partition function, actually. The next subset of uh, diagrams I want to talk about, right, is that of the one particle irreducible diagrams or the one particle irreducible green function. You usually refer to them as one PI for one particle irreducible uh, diagram, right? And that refers to the fact that some guy diagrams can be essentially divided in two by cutting their internal propagators, and some don't, right? So to give an example, and again, I'm staying in lambda phi four for most of my examples here. Think about this diagram. So there's two lambda phi four interactions, right? And this is a 1PI diagram, right? It cannot be divided in two by cutting just one internal propagator. Pay attention to this, right? When I say cutting a propagator, I'm referring to the internal ones. Of course, if you're writing this diagram in position space, 
there is a propagator here, but you know that this propagator, when you go to momentum space and more importantly, through the LSZ reduction formula, this will become one of the external legs of the diagram. I'm not referring to that because I can always uh, separate this diagram into itself, right? And another stupid diagram that is just the external point, right? Uh, when I'm, I'm talking about separating, I'm really referring to taking one of the internal propagators of the diagram and making it two external lines. To give a more concrete example, take a look at this diagram. Again, this is lambda phi 4, but it is the a six point green function. Right? This one. This is a 1PR, R for reducible, right? Diagram, because I can cut this internal line, transform this propagator into two external lines. The two diagrams I'm talking about are these, right? Where now this is an external line, I can even put a point for it at the end, right? So that this whole thing is a 1PR, right? And the two sub-diagrams here, this one, and this one are one PI diagrams, right? Another example is what happens in when you write the full propagator, right? One of the contributions to the full propagator is something like that. Hmm? This is again a, a one PR diagram. This is reducible because I can cut here, I can cut here. Right? And these smaller diagrams are 1PI. As are other contributions to the propagator, for instance. This is a 1PI. Right? There's no, there are only internal propagators in the loop, and if I cut one of them, I still have the diagram. Uh, I, I still didn't separate the diagram in two. This is another example. Right, this this setting sun diagram. No? And I can also define the sum of all the 1PI uh, contributions to any particular object, right? I will indicate that in this way. Say I, I, I want to calculate all 1PI contributions to the two-point function, right? I will indicate that like this, 1PI, right? So now this is not only the connected, right? Remember, I'm using a box for all the contributions, a circle to the all connected contributions. This is even more restrictive, is only the 1PI. So the connected ones would include this, right? But this sum does not include, include that one. So it looks like this one, right? So all the 1PI diagrams include, for instance, this guy, it includes this guy. And so on, amongst many others, right? So the setting sign is here too. And so it goes, I could put more stuff in here. So only the 1PI. And uh, the point here is that not only this is important because it allows me to organize my sum in a better way. You can see that in particular for the two-point function, we'll be able to resum this 1PI contributions, right? But also I can find a generating functional for this guy. And I want to show you that this generating functional is obtained from W of j, right, the generating function for all the connected diagrams through a Legendre transform, right, uh, the same way you obtain the Gibbs free energy from Helmholtz free energy in thermodynamics, right, if you, if you write the free energy in terms of the electric potential, right, this is the Legendre transform of um, the, the energy in terms of the charge, 
minus charge times the electric potential, right? Now we'll define a quantity. For now, I'll leave it open. There's some function of some variable, right? That will be obtained from W of J through a Legendre transform. I still have to, to discuss a little bit what will be um, these um, con uh, conjugate uh, variable here, right? But I want to show that. I want to, to get this conjugate variable and then show that this object that you obtain through this transformation will be a generating function of for the one pi diagrams, right? And that's that's useful because in many situations we are more interested in the one pi diagrams than in all diagrams. Now, from what we know from Legendre transforms, right? This conjugate variable should be given by the differentiation of w. I use minus w because it's really minus w that is the generating functional for um, for the connected diagrams, right? Uh, the conjugate variable should be given by the derivative of w in relation to j, right? In this case, since uh, our functions are not functions, are functionals, right? Uh, it's not the derivative, it's the functional derivative. But this, this is just the generalization of uh, Legendre transforms to this uh, functional uh, space, right? Now, w has been defined in this way, right? I took z of j and defined w like that, right? which, which can be inverted easily to get that w is just minus the log of z of j, right? Then if I calculate this uh, derivative, right, I'll get 1 over z of j times del z of j del j of x, right? Just taking the derivative of of the log because there's a minus here that compensates that minus. Now, this object we know, let me just repeat the 1 over z here, z of j, right? And, and z itself is just the vacuum vacuum transition, right? I can rewrite uh, z explicitly as the integral, uh, the, the path integral over phi, remember I'm talking about uh, scalar theory here, right? Exponential of minus the action. And of course, this is all in the presence of a source, so I must include the source term up here. Now, the effect of this derivative will be to act on this exponential and include the phi of x inside the integral here. So that what I, I'm writing, right, this, is the same as this, right? That's what the derivative does. And also we know that how to write these objects. Maybe that will make more clear, right? If I write them in the canonical formalism, right? I know that this object, right, is the vacuum expectation value because z was in the vacuum, right, of this operator, right, phi of x. Omega is the vacuum of the theory, and it will be the free theory or some more general, depending on what interactions I include here in the action, in the presence of a source. Remember, we have to keep the source. And z of j without the operator is, of course, just this, right? Just the normalization we always get here. And that, that shows pretty clearly what is the conjugate variable, right? It's the properly normalized vacuum expectation value of the field, right? This is uh, uh, the values, uh, uh, expected values for the field in the absence of particles, because I'm calculating this in the vacuum, right? This is what now defined, I think that's the first uh, time I define it 
properly, but I have been using this object uh, here and there. This is what I call a classical field in this theory. I will, will give you some interpretation of that in a second. So this is what I call the classical field in the presence of sources, right? The phi classical, it's a function of x, right? Uh, uh, maybe this notation is not that good, but it's also a function of x, right? And, and what I have shown here is that this phi classical, right? Now let me put it clearly, this phi classical, in the presence of sources is given by this derivative. So it is the conjugate variable in the Legendre transform I want, right? But also, if you look at this, this is the one point function, right? The connected, I use this C here, let me put it in color, right? To indicate I'm using the connected uh, functions uh, generator, right? in the presence of sources, right? So this is pretty important relation. And that's how I'll, I calculate this phi classical, right? Now let's think about this object uh, just for a second because it is physically important, right? And I think it's the easier, easiest place to get interpretations from it is from here, right? So this is what the field looks like if I make of course, this is the quantum theory now. So every time I measure the field, I'm not guaranteed to get the same value, right? What I can get is the expectation value, right? The average, if I keep measuring the field, right? But that in the absence of particles of this field, right? That's the important part. What I'm looking is the vacuum of the field, right? Which can have non-trivial configuration. We'll, we'll talk about the conditions for that in a second. But keep in mind that what I'm talking here, it, it, you could ask, right, if there's no particles, how do I see that? You could be using a different particle. You could be using a particle of another field, right? Say, suppose this is the, the electron field and you're using two photons to measure it, or the opposite, right? Uh, the point is I can have a test particle from a different field going through this uh, field phi here, right? And as long as this particle has not enough energy to excite particles, scalar particles of this field, right? What it, it will see if it has an interaction with this field, it will see this, this uh, ground state configuration of the field, right? It is clear for us that uh, at least in the free theory, right? If I calculate this, so instead of omega, I, I only used in the action there, right? Uh, I used only the free theory. So it's not omega, is zero, right? And in the absence of sources, right? So suppose I, I, I turn off any external uh, sources, then this is zero because then I can rewrite this guy as creation and annihilation operators that will get the free theory vacuum here and give me zero. And by the way, in the, in the denominator, I have no problem because this is in the absence of sources is normalized to one, right? That's the definition for the normalization of the vacuum of the free theory in the absence of sources. So you see here, there's at least two sources that could uh, change these uh, vacuum expectation value of the field. One is external sources, right? You could have just external uh, charges or currents that are generating a non-trivial configuration for this field, uh, or also interactions. We know that some theories have potentials which make the vacuum non-trivial, right? And if you have a VEV different from zero, you could have, you, you will have, for instance, a spontaneous symmetry break, right? So both interactions and external sources can change this VEV of the field, right? But the important thing to, to see is that this object I'm defining here is what substitute the classical field in a non-quantum theory, right? Because this is actually what you can observe 
It includes all, all quantum fluctuations possible in there, right? But not real particles, right? It's the ground state of the system, right? This is important. This is an important physical object, right? Sometimes you're actually interested in studying this guy. But now you see how you could observe the field using another kind of a test particle to go through it. Right? Also, diagrammatically, I have an uh, uh, expression for this guy because this is just the one-point function in the presence of sources. So, this is the diagram for right, following our, uh, our convention, right? This is given by the connected diagrams in the presence of the source. So this is what we call the classical field. Right? Every time you see this symbol, I'm really talking about uh, the value, the expectation value for the field, the point X, in the absence of excitation. Yeah? It's a very interesting object. And what I have shown so far is that I can use this guy in a Legendre transform of this form, right, to define this other object, which I have yet to prove is the generator of the 1PI um, green functions, right? We'll see that. For now, I'm just showing that this guy is, is a conjugate variable to, to J in a Legendre transform, right? That means this guy will be a function just of phi classical and not of J, that's all, right? To get a little more insight on the classical field, before we go uh, and look uh, more closely at this object and its relation to the 1PI functions, let's see an example of how the classical uh, field behaves, at least in a, in a very simple case, which is the, the free scalar theory. So let's take my action to be just the free scalar action, Right, so this. I'm in Euclidean uh, uh, space, so I don't care too much about the indexes. Phi square. Right, which of course I can rewrite uh, like this. And in the presence of sources, right? Let's call this S J of I, right? My my total action will be that one minus J phi, right? I can look for the classical solution, classical in the sense of classical fields, right? <laughs> now we have to be careful about what I call this phi classical, that actually include quantum corrections uh, uh, most of the time, right? Uh, but from what is this, the, the, the thing that you get from the principle of extreme action, right? So let's suppose we look for the classical solution in the sense that I just extremize this action, right? The solution will be the inverse of this guy, right? Which I call, uh, this is what I call delta minus one, right? And uh, if I use the principle of last action here, the, the extreme action here will be just delta minus one x acting on phi of x is equal to j of x, right? So the, the field configuration will be just the solution of this equation Right? which we know, if I invert this operator, right, then I get just the 4y delta, which is the inverse of that operator, is my propagator, right, x minus y, jy, right? It's what we I have been calling a lot, just delta j, which is a function of x, right? That's the solution, the classical solution to that equation. Right? Now, just to, to, to get some uh, better intuition, let's think of a very specific form of a source, right? Let's take this source, j of x, 
is just a Dirac delta at a specific point in space. Right? It does not evolve on time. Right? It's, it's a constant delta Dirac, Dirac delta acting at one point. I'm essentially forcing the value of the field in that point and seeing the influence everywhere else. Also, to make this simple, let's take the mass of this classical field equal to zero. In that case, right, the, the, the configuration of the field in the presence of a source that does not depend on time won't de depend on time either. So I can say that phi x is equal to phi of x, just the position, right? And rewrite this equation. Now the time derivatives here will, will give me zero when they act on phi because phi does not depend on zero. And inverting this will only involve uh, uh, space coordinates, right? And my propagator will be right, just like a Coulomb law, right? So everywhere the field, right? will be just falling like a Coulomb law as you go away from that point uh, y, right? If you substitute that, you can get a value for the field everywhere, just as one over x, right? We also know that um, the free theory partition function is given by these, right? exponential of half of j delta j, right? And that I can get this free energy, w, zero of j. We call this free energy because of the analogy with thermodynamics, right? It's minus the log of that. So in the case of the free theory, uh, w is very simple. It's just minus j delta j and that means that the phi classical of j which i define as this conjugate variable to w to minus w to be precise right j of x in this case will be just delta j of x, right? That's what happens when you act with these derivatives here. You can act here or here. The minus goes away and the factor 2 comes from the two options, right? And this is symmetric under the exchange of delta per j, right? It's just a scalar product. So what I'm saying is that in the free theory, right, the phi classical object, now I'm writing this diagrammatically, right? Remember, this is the classical field, right? What I'm saying is that in the free theory, so let me put an exclamation point here because that causes a lot of confusion, right? This is specific to the free theory. It's just this, with what we have seen before, right? It's just the influence of the source, right? I'm integrating over the source on all space-time, right? and propagating that influence to x. And that's what I measure in x, the value of the field influenced by that source, right? And, and here you see a perfect example, right? This Coulomb law is happening because my particle is massless. This is important, right? And because I'm, I'm, I'm putting a source in a point. This is like a point-like charge for this field. So generating a Coulomb uh, configuration for the field everywhere else in, in space, right? And this is all independent on time because I, I, I made my, my so external source independent on time. Huh? So for the free theory, you can uh, very easily see uh, uh, what happens. And I also see that the classical the classical field here, which is a quantum expectation value, is coinciding with the classical solution. But that's because without interactions, I, I don't produce any quantum correction, right? I have no bubbles anywhere, nor 
it's just these diagrams and then the classical viewing coincides with the quantum expectation value right which is another important fact that happens when i turn interactions off right now let's think let's use this example to see what would have happened if i had interactions on right now I, i'm not thinking about this theory anymore so let's think in general right about the classical field in the presence of interactions and again we will use uh, uh, lambda phi 4 just as a good example right so of course this contribution is here i can write this diagrammatically right the only the only uh, constraint i have to be careful with is that i only draw connected diagrams right which is easy in this case right? so of course this diagram is included but now i have new things if i turn the interaction on right i also have for instance this right and for instance right this is on point x also this one source 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 we have calculated uh, these uh, parts of this series before right in the start of the video hmm? plus order lambda square corrections this goes on and on and that shows you how this uh, classical field that we have defined is different from the classical field the, from the equations of motion right this is what we ob you would obtain from the equations of motion and this is what you obtain including quantum fluctuations and interactions right uh, this is the what i would call the classical classical field right it's 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 classical in the sense that there's no really no quantum corrections not anything it's just a, uh, what you get from extremizing the action and this is uh, what i would call a classical field but in the sense that it's not relativistic or at least it has not enough energy to produce excitation right it's a low energy regime uh, of my full theory but it includes all quantum corrections all the way to uh, arbitrary powers of lambda right and these all these corrections here are just possible in the presence of interactions if the theory is a no interacting theory you don't get any of these corrections right so the next step now is try to reorganize that sum because doing that it's not obvious right but by doing a reorganization of this sum i can actually make that generating functional show up and and then i can prove to you that this uh, generating functional is the generator of the one pi contributions so let's let's start to to do that let's try to reorganize this sum for that I, i'll write a few more terms let me copy this or better yet i can remove the noise and put a few more corrections right so i'll just put enough so we can see the pattern i can i, I want to show so let me put the sunset one x let me put again this is the one point function so it always depends on one variable which i'm calling x let me put the sunset followed by this uh plus a few more okay this is really crazy one these are all vertices of lambda phi 4 right this is a closed loop and there are many lambda phi 4 vertices there Right, this is valid diagram let me put one more and then we're done 
I think this is complexity enough to not notice uh, what I want to show, right? This goes on. Be as creative as you want. Now I want you to identify two um, building blocks here, right? So, for instance, I, I can fish out many 1PI contributions here. So this is a 1PI contribution. This is another one, right? Which, by the way, repeats here, right? And also here, that one, that first one is also repeating here, right? And I also have, and, and but the import, more importantly, this is a 1PI contribution that if you look at the edges of the box I have drawn, this is a two-point 1PI diagram, right? It has two external lines, right? It's the lines that escape my blue box here. And I can also look for 1PI contributions, which have four external lines. For instance, the vertex itself. The vertex itself is a 1PI diagram with four lines going outside. But so is this. And that's why I, did, I draw such a crazy thing, right? No matter the complexity here, this is a function that has one, two, three, four lines going out of it. Right? So is this, and so is that one. Right? So I want to reorganize the sum over these two types of contributions. Right? For that, I'll, I'll give a name right, for, to the 1PI two-point contributions and the 1PI four-point contribution. And that's how I represent them right, right, right here. So you have to understand that this two, this pi two object here is the sum of this box plus this one plus whatever other uh, one pi contributions that have only two external legs going out. This gamma four here will be this plus this one plus whatever other contributions that have only four external legs. Right? Using only these two that show show up here. Right? You can see that I can rewrite this now in a way that includes much more diagrams. So, for instance, take this diagram. This is just X going into this guy, right? That then goes into the source, right? Now, in here, I'm including, including this plus this, right? Plus whatever other big contributions, right? I could put more stuff right here, right? I could put crazy uh, complicated diagrams. They are all included here, right? This next one, say, this next diagram, I could rewrite uh, in this way. I put a four here. Let me erase these two guys, right? And then it goes to the source because this gamma four object has four external legs that goes into the go into the source. That includes this diagram, this one, and even more complicated ones. I'm summing over a, a whole a, a much bigger series in, in each of these objects here, right? Also this object, for instance, I could write like this, right? X goes into the 2.1 that goes into uh, the 4.1 that then go into three sources. In this diagram, I'm including this diagram, but also a diagram that would have this guy and this one in here, right? And even this times this one again, right? And for instance, this diagram is the opposite. Gamma 4 comes before pi 2. That's another contribution, right? What I want you to see is that I can reorganize my, my series for the classical field in terms of uh, these uh, 1PI sums. And they, these are infinite number of diagrams in each part here, right? 
In fact, I want to do that. This is what happens in lambda phi 4. Right? I want to do that to more general theories. Right? And in that case, I also have similar objects, say, for one point function. So in that case, I could write this as, of course, there's always this contribution. That's the, the one that's always present, right? Plus, say something that goes into a one point, uh, one PI contribution. That's not present in lambda phi four, but for instance, if you were thinking of lambda phi three, then there is this vertex, right? The tadpole one that would be included here. And I want to define the, uh, the only one I'm naming differently is the two point function. Every other one will be called gamma, right? So let's go a little bit further here just to, and it will be clear why I'm calling uh, the two point function differently further down the line, right? So then there is of course this contribution, right? Then there could be something like this, that instead of going into the source, now it goes into this uh, uh, dead end here, right? The one point, one PI functions. And of course, you could have even more complicated stuff that involves, for instance, these, right? And in general, and that's true too, I only have gamma four in lambda phi four, but in lambda phi three, phi, phi three, for instance, I would have also a gamma three that would go then into sources, right? And so on and so forth. So I'm defining now the sum over all the one PI diagrams for one external leg, for two external legs, for three external legs, for four external legs, and so on. I can define, of course, some of these will be zero for a particular interaction, right? At all orders, right? Like we have seen for lambda phi four, all the odd ones are zero. For lambda phi three, all the even ones are zero. So you, 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 can, you can see that there are trends that depend on the interaction. But in general, you can write this series in this way. Now, now let's try to find a way to at least partially uh, resum this series, right? Let's take a look at this uh, thing I wrote up here, right? And take a look at the structure that is arising here. Let me let me uh, get a little bit more space. Let me see if everything's showing, right? And let me write this now uh, explicitly. Take this term, right? That we know is just delta j. That depends on point x, right? Which again I can write as d for say y delta x minus y j y, right? This only depends on x. Now this contribution, right? I can write using the same kind of notation, right? This is delta because there's a propagator growing from x into some vertex in there, right? So I can write this as delta gamma one. And this is also just a function of x, right? Because this object is just a fun function of x. So each of these pieces is just a function of x, right? But I can rewrite this as the integral of d four uh, why? Let's call the same way in this case I'm calling this point Y, right? Let me call this point where it interacts with the rest of the, the complicated diagram that is here, Y. That's where this propagator is going to, right? This will be written as D4Y, right? Delta of X minus Y times this uh, f function, right? Which can be a very complicated uh, 
integral over all the loops that show up in here. Hmm? Now, what happens in this case? Let me change the color again. In this case, I have something that is... There are two points now, right? Let's baptize this one Y and this one Z. Hmm? Now, I have an integral in D for Z of an object that is just delta times pi 2, right? which itself, this whole piece, is just a function of uh, x and z, right? y is integrated over, is hidden inside this integral, but it is a function of these two points, z and x, and that's multiplied by something that depends on z, right? I could write this propagator, right, like a propagator from uh, uh, this point z to where the source is uh, uh, put. I put another uh, coordinate for the source, right? So it would be like a propagator from z to w, j of w, and I have to integrate over w, right? But I don't want to do that. The point here is that this piece that needs to be multiplied here only depends on z, right? And more importantly, let's see what I could put here, right? So I have a function of z here. Let me write a proper z. Right? But which function is that? In order to see, check this out, right? This is this piece, right? That goes here, which was just the propagator source, right? But I could also include this one, which only depends on the point that is here. I could put it here. I could put it this here, right? In fact, I could this series that is start with uh, going to the source plus this piece plus this piece is again the same source for the classical field, right? Realize that everything that has shown up in the series for the classical field can show up again here, just depending on z, right? Say, this term is the same as this, this one is the same as this, this is again the same term I'm already looking, right? So I can just resum and write phi classical of z. I have resummed the series, right? I know that phi classical will appear here again uh, if I include all diagrams that start with external point pi 2 something, right? That's something I get the series for the phi classical all over again, and it is a function just of z in this case. Right? I can do the same here, right? That's the, I mean, that's the whole point, right? That's how I'm resumming this series, right? If I look at this little piece here and this little piece here, I can keep doing diagrams and include the next diagram. Just take these two small pieces here and put a, a, a gamma 1 in each of them. And after put a gamma 1, I can put a gamma 2 times a source and everything else again, the whole series again. That means that this piece I could just write as, let me get green here again, as something that is delta going to gamma 3. Right? This is a function of x. I, I can baptize this point z and this point w. Right? So a function of z and w. I don't have to baptize this point because, again, it's hidden in this, in this uh, uh, scalar product and integrated all over. Right? But then these two little pieces here, I can put just phi classical calculated at z and phi classical calculated at w, right? And resum the series. Now let's, let's write this, right? What I'm writing here is a very important relation now. What I'm saying is that phi classical of x this term, can be written as 
the integral over d4y, right? Now I have to start putting these terms. Let's start with this one, right? This is a delta x minus y, and this delta minus y appears here, appears here, right? That's what's hidden in this scalar product. That's what's hidden in this scalar product. So it appears all over. I'll keep it uh, in front of everyone, right? So the first term here is just j of y, right? This piece, these two others are out here. In this case, I have, instead of j, I have gamma 1, but I'll put a sign here, right? which is just a convention. I can have a sign convention for all these guys, and I'm using it uh, as a minus, right? I could put redefine this object as minus itself, and, and you see that minus is useful later, but it's just a convention, right? So what shows up here is gamma 1 of y. For this guy, now I have this integral in z, d for z, pi 2, which depends on two points, right? y and z. y is connected to this propagator out here by this integral, right? And z is what connects it to the rest of the diagrams that come to the right of it. So phi classical of z. Okay? Now, this already includes this and this, right? So I can go straight to this part, right? which won't fit in my screen here, so go below. Right? This is plus half. What is this factor half? It's a symmetry factor because I can exchange these two legs here. They are not connected to anything, so I can easily uh, exchange these two classical fields, so I need to put a symmetry factor. Right? D for Z, D for W, Right, these two points, gamma three, sorry, gamma three, which is a function of these three points, right? Y that is hidden here and connected to this propagator, Z and W, right? And of course, this is multiplying phi classical of Z and phi classical of W. Hmm? And so it goes. I hope I can convince you that I can go as far as I want with this series, right? Just writing X, a propagator to some gamma, right? I did gamma 1, P2, but I could use gamma 2, gamma 3, I could do gamma 4, gamma 5, gamma 6, and always I'll have, I'll have one line connected to x and n minus one lines connected to classical fields, right? So that the if I go to an arbitrary term in this sum, it will look like one over n minus one factorial, and n minus one is because this guy has n legs. But one of them is collected to the external point. So the symmetry factor is due to the n minus one legs that are connected to uh, the classical field again, right? I'll have d for z1 to d for z n minus one for the same reason, right? This n minus one points that are on the right here, the integral to the point that goes there is already here. Right? And I'll have a gamma n that is a function of y to the left, right? Connecting to the external point. And all these z's from z1 to z n minus 1. And these will be multiplied by classical of z1 all the way to phi classical of z n minus 1, right? And this goes on. 
to infinity, right? Let me see if I have to close bracket. So I need to close this bracket and then this one big curly bracket, right? This is a pretty important uh, equation, right? Because it gives me a recursion relation to Phi classical, right? This, this, this gives me a, a way to resum all contributions and, and write Phi classical in terms of itself, right? It's a self-consistent um, equation. And that allows me to define now the generating functional, right? I won't prove, uh, well, let me define it and then I'll see what I can prove and what I cannot prove immediately, right? So I'll define these for now, gamma hat, right? You'll see why of the hat pretty soon, of phi classical, the functional of phi classical as, so let me, color this as a definition as gamma 1 times phi classical plus half of p2 these are these functions that are up here scalar phi classical scalar phi classical remember each of these scalar products means right the for some variable, right? Y, phi classical Y, right? In the case of these guys that depend on two uh, variables, I have to integrate in both of them. One of the phi classicals will depend on one, the other one will depend on the other, right? So this is exactly uh, expression like that, but also with phi classical of Y here, right? And, and go on like that, three factorial, gamma 3, phi classical. So be careful with these multiple dots. That means all the variables are integrated over. This guy depends on three variables. Each of these phi classicals will depend on one of them and they are all integrated. And this goes on, right? And you see that this object, right? If I take, uh, for, and this is the important part, right? The, the two point functions are more complicated. If I take n different than two, right? It is true that I can get any of these uh, one pi sums, right? As a number of derivatives of this guy, right? If I take this guy, and I differentiate it in the phi classical, uh, and in the end, I take phi classical equal to zero, right? What I'll get is one of these functions, which is a sum of all the one pi diagrams uh, for that number of points. So if I differentiate this twice, or twice is the one case where it's not good, right? Let's say three times, right? I only get this term, right? Gamma three. Once I take phi classical equal to zero because these terms will be already zero because I differentiated too much and gamma four will still be multiplied by phi classical, right? So this is this generating functional for the one pi sums, right? These gammas here are the one pi sums for a certain number of external legs, right? And, and, and of course, for n equal two, right? For n equal two, then the expression is this one. For, in, for, for now, it just looks like a notation, but I'll explain why I'm doing this in, in a few minutes, right? For n equal two, this is the expression. I right? still two derivatives. 
classical X2 of the same object for phi classical equals zero. Right? The thing is I didn't define gamma two. I only defined this pi two. Right? So there you go, you have the generating functional. I still have to show that this object that I define here is the same that I obtained through the Legendre transform that I said above, right? It's not clear that it is the same object at all, right? So I have to show that. But this video is already getting too long. So just so we don't forget, right? I have to still show that this generating function or something very similar to it will be the same as you get as this Legendre transform from the W, right? So far, I found a generating function for the 1PI functions, right? And I also have to explain this uh, difference I'm making with the two-point uh, 1PI sum, right? And you see that when I, I solve this thing with the pi2 here, I will also remove this hat and define an object that is in terms of gamma2, right? And, but we'll do that on next video. This is uh, good enough for today. So see you next video.